A Smile of Fortune, Chapter 6 Either would have been perfectly consistent with my feelings. I gazed at the door, hesitating, but in the end I did neither. The monition of some sixth sense, a sense of guilt maybe, that sense which always acts too late, alas, warned me to look round, and at once I became aware that the conclusion of this tumultuous episode was likely to be a matter of lively anxiety. Jacobus was standing in the doorway of the dining room. How long he had been there, it was impossible to guess. And remembering my struggle with the girl, I thought he must have been its mute witness from beginning to end. But this supposition seemed almost incredible. Perhaps that impenetrable girl had heard him come in and had got away in time. He stepped onto the veranda in his usual manner, heavy-eyed and with glued lips. I marveled at the girl's resemblance to this man. Those long Egyptian eyes, that low forehead of a stupid goddess she had found in the sawdust of the circus. But all the rest of the face, the design and the modeling, the rounded chin, the very lips, all that was Jacobus, fined down, more finished, more expressive. His thick hand fell on and grasped with force the back of a light chair. There were several standing about, and I perceived the chance of a broken head at the end of all this, most likely. My mortification was extreme. The scandal would be horrible, and that was unavoidable. But how to act so as to satisfy myself, I did not know. I stood on my guard, and at any rate faced him. There was nothing else for it. Of one thing I was certain, that however brazen my attitude, it could never equal the characteristic Jacobus impudence. He gave me his melancholy, glued smile and sat down. I own I was relieved. The perspective of passing from kisses to blows had nothing particularly attracted in it. Perhaps, perhaps he had seen nothing. He behaved as usual, but he had never before found me alone on the veranda. If he had alluded to it, if he had asked, where is Alice, or something of the sort, I would have been able to judge from the tone. He would give me no opportunity. The striking peculiarity was that he had never looked up at me yet. He knows, I said to myself confidently, and my contempt for him relieved my disgust with myself. You are early home, I remarked. Things are very quiet. Nothing doing at the store today, he explained with a cast-down air. Oh well, you know, I am off, I said, feeling that this perhaps was the best thing to do. Yes, he breathed out, day after tomorrow. This was not what I had meant, but as he gazed persistently on the floor, I followed the direction of his glance. In the absolute stillness of the house, we stared at the high-heeled slipper the girl had lost in her flight. We stared. It lay overturned. After what seemed a very long time to me, Jacobus hitched his chair forward, stooped, with extended arm and picked it up. It looked a slender thing in his big, thick hands. It was not really a slipper, but a low shoe of blue glazed kid, rubbed and shabby. It had straps to go over the instep, but the girl only thrust her feet in after her slovenly manner. Jacobus raised his eyes from the shoe to look at me. Sit down, Captain, he said at last in his subdued tone. As if the sight of that shoe had renewed the spell, I gave up suddenly the idea of leaving the house there and then. It had become impossible. I sat down, keeping my eyes on the fascinating object. Jacobus turned his daughter's shoe over and over in his cushioned paws, as if studying the way the thing was made. He contemplated the thin sole for a time, then glancing inside with an absorbed air. I am glad I found you here, Captain. I answered this by some sort of grunt, watching him covertly. Then I added, You won't have much more of me now. 
He was still deep in the interior of that shoe on which my eyes too were resting. Have you thought any more of this deal in potatoes I spoke to you about the other day? No, I haven't, I answered curtly. He checked my movement to rise by an austere commanding gesture of the hand holding that fatal shoe. I remained seated and glared at him. You know I don't trade. You ought to, Captain. You ought to. I reflected. If I left that house now, I would never see the girl again, and I felt I must see her once more, if only for an instant. It was a need, not to be reasoned with, not to be disregarded. No, I did not want to go away. I wanted to stay for one more experience of that strange provoking sensation and of indefinite desire, the habit of which had made me me, of all people, dread the prospect of going to sea. Mr. Jacobus, I pronounced slowly, do you really think that upon the whole, and taking various matters into consideration, I mean everything, do you understand, it would be a good thing for me to trade, let us say, with you? I waited for a while. He went on looking at the shoe, which he held, now crushed in the middle, the worn point of the toe and the high heel protruding on each side of his heavy fist. That will be all right, he said, facing me squarely at last. Are you sure? You'll find it quite correct, Captain. He had uttered his habitual phrases in his usual placid, breath-saving voice and stood my hard, inquisitive stare sleepily without as much as a wink. Then let us trade, I said, turning my shoulder to him. I see you were bent on it. I did not want an open scandal, but I thought that outward decency may be bought too dearly at times. I included Jacobus, myself, the whole population of the island, and the same contemptuous disgust as though we had been partners in an ignoble transaction, and the remembered vision at sea, diaphanous and blue, of the pearl of the ocean at sixty miles off, the unsubstantial, clear marvel of it, as if evoked by the art of a beautiful and pure magic, turned into a thing of horrors, too. Was this the fortune, this vaporous and rare apparition, had held for me in its hard heart, hidden within the shape as of fair dreams and mist? Was this my luck? I think Jacobus became suddenly audible after what seemed the silence of vile meditation that you might conveniently take some thirty tons. That would be about the lot, Captain. Would it? The lot. I dare say it would be convenient, but I haven't got enough money for that. I had never seen him so animated. No, he exclaimed with what I took for the accent of grim menace. That's a pity, he paused, then, unrelenting. How much money have you got, Captain? he inquired with awful directness. It was my turn to face him squarely. I did so, and mentioned the amount I could dispose of, and I perceived that he was disappointed. He thought it over, his calculating gaze lost in me, for quite a long time before he came out in a thoughtful tone with the rapacious suggestion you could draw some more from your charters. That would be quite easy, Captain. No, I couldn't, I retorted brusquely. I've drawn my salary up to date, and besides, the ship's accounts are closed. I was growing furious, I pursued. And I'll tell you what, if I could do it, I wouldn't. Then throwing off all restraint, I added, You are a bit too much of a Jacobus, Mr. Jacobus. The tone alone was insulting enough, but he remained tranquil, only a little puzzled, till something seemed to dawn upon him, but the unwanted light in his eyes died out instantly. As a Jacobus on his native heath, what a mere skipper chose to say could not touch him, outcast as he was. As a ship chandler, he could stand anything. All I caught of his mumble was a vague quite correct, than which nothing could have been more egregiously false at the bottom, to my view at least, 
But I remembered. I had never forgotten that I must see the girl. I did not mean to go. I meant to stay in the house till I had seen her once more. Look here, I said finally. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take as many of your confounded potatoes as my money will buy, on condition that you go off at once down to the wharf to see them loaded in the lighter and sent alongside the ship straightway. Take the invoice and a signed receipt with you. Here's the key of my desk. Give it to Burns. He will pay you. He got up from his chair before I had finished speaking, but he refused to take the key. Burns would never do it. He wouldn't like to ask him even. Well then, I said, eyeing him slightly, there's nothing for it, Mr. Jacobus, but you must wait on board till I come off to settle with you. That will be all right, Captain. I will go at once. He seemed at a loss what to do with the girl's shoe he was still holding in his fist. Finally, looking dully at me, he put it down on the chair from which he had risen. And you, Captain, won't you come along too, just to see? Don't bother me about that. I'll take care of myself. He remained perplexed for a moment, as if trying to understand, and then his weighty, certainly, certainly, Captain, seemed to be the outcome of some sudden thought. His big chest heaved. Was it a sigh? As he went out to hurry off those potatoes, he never looked back at me. I waited till the noise of his footsteps had died out of the dining room, and I waited a little longer. Then turning towards the distant door, I raised my voice along the veranda. Alice! Nothing answered me, not even a stir behind the door. Jacobus's house might have been made empty for me to take myself at home in. I did not call again. I had become aware of a great discouragement. I was mentally jaded, morally dejected. I turned to the garden again, sitting down with my elbows spread on the low balustrade, and took my head in my hands. The evening closed upon me. The shadows lengthened, deepened, mingled together into a pool of twilight in which the flower beds glowed like colored embers. Whiffs of heavy scent came to me as if the dusk of this hemisphere were but the dimness of a temple and the garden an enormous censer swinging before the altar of the stars. The colors of the blossoms deepened losing their glow one by one. The girl, when I turned my head at a slight noise, appeared to me, very tall and slender, advancing with a swaying limp, a floating and uneven motion which ended in the sinking of her shadowy form into the deep low chair, and I don't know why or whence I received the impression that she had come too late. She ought to have appeared at my call, she ought to have. It was as if a supreme opportunity had been missed. I rose and took a seat close to her, nearly opposite her armchair. Her ever discontented voice addressed me at once, contemptuously. You are still here? I pitched mine low. You have come out at last. I came to look for my shoe before they bring in the lights. It was her harsh, enticing whisper, subdued, not very steady, but its low tremulousness gave me no thrill now. I could only make out the oval of her face, her uncovered throat, the long, white gleam of her eyes. She was mysterious enough. Her hands were resting on the arms of the chair. But where was the mysterious and provoking sensation which was like the perfume of her flower-like youth? I said quietly, I've got your shoe here. She made no sound, and I continued, You had better give me your foot, and I will put it on for you. She made no movement. I bent low down and groped for her foot under the flounces of the wrapper. She did not withdraw it, and I put on the shoe, buttoning the instep strap. It was an inanimate foot. I lowered it gently to the floor. If you buttoned the strap, you would not be losing your shoe, Miss Don't Care, I said, trying to be playful without conviction. I felt more like 
wailing over the lost illusion of vague desire, over the sudden conviction that I would never find again near her the strange, half-evil, half-tender sensation which had given its acrid flavor to so many days, which had made her appear tragic and promising, pitiful and provoking. That was all over. Your father picked it up, I said, thinking she may just as well be told of the fact. I'm not afraid of Papa by himself, she declared scornfully. Oh, it's only in conjunction with his disreputable associates, strangers, the riffraff of Europe, as your charming aunt or great aunt says. Men like me, for instance, that you... I'm not afraid of you, she snapped out. That's because you don't know I am now doing business with your father. Yes, I am in fact doing exactly what he wants me to do. I've broken my promise to you. That's the sort of man I am. And now, aren't you afraid, if you believe what that dear, kind, truthful old lady says you ought to be? It was with unexpected modulated softness that the affirmed, No, I am not afraid, she hesitated. Not now. Quite right. You needn't be. I shall not see you again before I go to sea. I rose and stood near her chair, but I shall often think of you in this old garden, passing under the trees over there, walking between these gorgeous flower beds. You must love this garden. I love nothing. I heard in her sullen tone the faint echo of that resentfully tragic note which I had found once so provoking but it left me unmoved except for a sudden and weary conviction of the emptiness of all things under heaven. Goodbye, Alice, I said. She did not answer. She did not move. To merely take her hand, shake it, and go away seemed impossible, almost improper. I stood without haste and pressed my lips to her smooth forehead. This was the moment when I realized clearly with a sort of terror, my complete detachment from that unfortunate creature, and as I lingered in the cruel self-knowledge, I felt the light touch of her arms falling languidly on my neck, and received a hasty, awkward, haphazard kiss, which missed my lips. No, she was not afraid, but I was no longer moved. Her arms slipped off my neck slowly, she made no sound. The deep, wicker armchair creaked slightly. Only a sense of my dignity prevented me fleeing headlong from that catastrophic revelation. I traversed the dining room slowly. I thought, she's listening to my footsteps. She can't help it. She'll hear me open and shut that door. And I closed it as gently behind me as if I had been a thief retreating with his ill-gotten booty. During that stealthy act, I experienced the last touch of emotion in that house. At the thought of the girl I had left sitting there in the obscurity, with her heavy hair and empty eyes as black as the night itself, staring into the walled garden, silent, warm, odorous with the perfume of imprisoned flowers, which like herself were lost to sight in a world buried in darkness. The narrow, ill-lighted, rustic streets I knew so well on my way to the harbor were extremely quiet. I felt in my heart that the further one ventures, the better one understands how everything in our life is common, short, and empty, and that it is in seeking the unknown in our sensations that we discover how mediocre are our attempts and how soon defeated Jacobus's boatman was waiting at the steps with an unusual air of readiness. He put me alongside the ship, but did not give me his confidential good evening, sir, and instead of shoving off at once, remained holding by the ladder. I was a thousand miles from commercial affairs when on the dark quarter-deck Mr. Burns positively rushed at me, stammering with excitement. He had been pacing the deck distractedly for hours, waiting my arrival. Just before sunset, a lighter, 
loaded with potatoes, had come alongside with that fat ship chandler himself sitting on the pile of sacks. He was now stuck, immovable in the cabin. What was the meaning of it all? Surely I did not. Yes, Mr. Burns, I did, I cut him short. He was beginning to make gestures of despair when I stopped that, too, by giving him the key of my desk and desiring him, in a tone which admitted of no argument, to go below at once, pay Mr. Jacobus's bill, and send him out of the ship. I don't want to see him, I confessed frankly, climbing the poop ladder. I felt extremely tired. Dropping on the seat of the skylight, I gave myself up to the idle gazing at the lights about the quay and at the black mass of the mountain on the south side of the harbor. I never heard Jacobus leave the ship with every single sovereign of my ready cash in his pocket. I never heard anything till a long time afterwards Mr. Burns, unable to contain himself any longer, intruded upon me with his ridiculously angry lamentations at my weakness and good nature. Of course, there's plenty of room in the after hatch, but they are sure to go rotten down there. Well, I never heard. Seventeen tons. I suppose I must hoist in that lot first thing tomorrow morning. I suppose you must, unless you drop them overboard, but I'm afraid you can't do that. I wouldn't mind myself, but it's forbidden to throw rubbish into the harbor, you know. That is the truest word you have said for many a day, sir. Rubbish. That's just what I expect they are. Nearly eighty good gold sovereigns gone. A perfectly clean sweep of your drawer, sir. Bless me if I understand. As it was impossible to throw the right light on this commercial transaction, I left him to his lamentations, and under the impression that I was a hopeless fool. Next day I did not go ashore. For one thing, I had no money to go ashore with. No, not even to buy a cigarette. Jacobus had made a clean sweep, but that was not the only reason. The pearl of the ocean had in a few short hours grown odious to me, and I did not want to meet anyone. My reputation had suffered. I knew I was the object of unkind and sarcastic comments. The following morning, at sunrise, just as our stern fasts had been let go and the tug plucked us out from beneath the buoys, I saw Jacobus standing up in his boat. The nigger was pulling hard. Several baskets of provisions for ships were stowed between the thwarts. The father of Alice was going his morning round. His countenance was tranquil and friendly. He raised his arm and shouted something with great heartiness, but his voice was of the sort that doesn't carry any distance. All I could catch faintly, or rather guess at, were the words next time, and quite correct. And it was only of these last that I was certain. Raising my arm perfunctorily for all response, I turned away. I rather resented the familiarity of the thing. Hadn't I settled accounts finally with him by means of that potato bargain? This being a harbor story, it is not my purpose to speak of our passage. I was glad enough to be at sea, but not with the gladness of old days. Formerly, I had no memories to take away with me. I shared in the blessed forgetfulness of sailors, that forgetfulness natural and invincible, which resembles innocence in so far that it prevents self-examination. Now, however, I remembered the girl. During the first few days, I was forever questioning myself as to the nature of facts and sensations connected with her person and with my conduct. And I must also say that Mr. Burns' intolerable fussing with those potatoes was not calculated to make me forget the part which I had played. He looked upon it as a purely commercial transaction of a particularly foolish kind, and his devotion, if it was devotion and not mere cussedness, as I came to regard it before long, 
inspired him with a zeal to minimize my loss as much as possible. Oh yes, he took care of those infamous potatoes with a vengeance, as the saying goes. Everlastingly, there was a tackle over the afterhatch, and everlastingly the watch on deck were pulling up, spreading out, picking over, rebagging, and lowering down again some part of that lot of potatoes. My bargain, with all its remotest associations, mental and visual, the garden of flowers and scents, the girl with her provoking contempt and her tragic loneliness of a hopeless castaway, was everlastingly dangled before my eyes for thousands of miles along the open sea, and as if by a satanic refinement of irony, it was accompanied by a most awful smell. Whiffs from decaying potatoes pursued me on the poop. They mingled with my thoughts, with my food, poisoned my very dreams. They made an atmosphere of corruption for the ship. I remonstrated with Mr. Burns about this excess of care. I would have well content to batten the hatch down and let them perish under the deck. That perhaps would have been unsafe. The horrid emanations might have flavored the cargo of sugar. They seemed strong enough to taint the very ironwork. In addition, Mr. Burns made it a personal matter. He assured me he knew how to treat a cargo of potatoes at sea. Had been in the trade as a boy, he said. He meant to make my loss as small as possible. What between his devotion, it must have been devotion, and his vanity, I positively dared not give him the order to throw my commercial venture overboard. I believed he would have refused point blank to obey my lawful command. An unprecedented and comical situation would have been created with which I did not feel equal to deal. I welcomed the coming of bad weather as no sailor had ever done. When, at last, I hove the ship to, to pick up the pilot outside Port Phillip heads, the afterhatch had not been opened for more than a week, and I might have believed that no such thing as a potato had ever been on board. It was an abominable day, raw, blustering, with great squalls of wind and rain, the pilot a cheery person looking after the ship and chatted to me streaming from head to foot and the heavier the lash of the downpour the more pleased with himself and everything around him he seemed to be he rubbed his wet hands with a satisfaction which to me who stood that kind of thing for several days and nights seemed inconceivable in any non-aquatic creature you seem to enjoy getting wet, Pilot, I remarked. He had a bit of land round his house in the suburbs, and it was of his garden he was thinking. At the sound of the word garden, unheard, unspoken for so many days, I had a vision of gorgeous color, of sweet scents, of a girlish figure crouching in a chair. Yes, that was a distinct emotion breaking into the peace I had found, and the sleepless anxieties of my responsibility during a week of dangerous bad weather. The colony, the pilot explained, had suffered from unparalleled drought. This was the first decent drop of water they had had for seven months. The root crops were lost, and trying to be casual, but with visible interest, he asked me if I had perchance any potatoes to spare. Potatoes? I had managed to forget them. In a moment I felt plunged into corruption up to my neck. Mr. Burns was making eyes at me behind the pilot's back. Finally he obtained a ton and paid ten pounds for it. This was twice the price of my bargain with Jacobus. The spirit of covetousness woke up in me. That night in harbor, before I slept, the custom house galley came alongside. While his underlings were putting seals on the storerooms, the officer in charge took me aside confidentially. I say, Captain, you don't happen to have any potatoes to sell. Clearly, there was a potato famine in the land. I let him have a ton for twelve pounds, and he went away joyfully. 
That night I dreamt of a pile of gold in the form of a grave in which a girl was buried and woke up callous with greed. On calling at my shipbroker's office, that man, after the usual business had been transacted, pushed his spectacles up on his forehead. I was thinking, Captain, that coming from the pearl of the ocean, you may have some potatoes to sell. I said negligently, Oh, yes, I could spare you a ton, fifteen pounds. He exclaimed, I say, but after studying my face for a while, accepted my terms with a faint grimace. It seems that these people could not exist without potatoes. I could. I didn't want to see a potato as long as I lived, but the demon of lucre had taken possession of me. How the news got about, I don't know, but returning on board rather late, I found a small group of men on the coaster type hanging about the waist, while Mr. Burns walked to and fro the quarter deck loftily, keeping a triumphant eye on them. They had come to buy potatoes. These chaps have been waiting here in the sun for hours, Burns whispered to me excitedly. They have drank the water cask dry. Don't you throw away your chances, sir. You are too good-natured. I selected a man with thick legs and a man with a cast in his eye to negotiate with, simply because they are easily distinguished from the rest. You have the money on you, I inquired, before taking them down into the cabin. Yes, yes, they answered in one voice, slapping their pockets. I liked their air of quiet determination. Long before the end of the day, all the potatoes were sold at about three times the price I had paid for them. Mr. Burns, feverish and exulting, congratulated himself on his skill, full care of commercial venture, but hinted plainly that I ought to have made more of it. That night I did not sleep very well. I thought of Jacobus by fits and starts, between snatches of dreams concerned with castaways starving on a desert island covered with flowers. It was extremely unpleasant. In the morning, tired and unrefreshed, I sat down and wrote a long letter to my owners, giving them a carefully thought-out scheme for the ship's employment in the East and about the China Seas for the next two years. I spent the day at that task, and I felt somewhat more at peace when it was done. Their reply came in due course. They were greatly struck with my project, but considering that, notwithstanding the unfortunate difficulty with the bags, which they trusted I would know how to guard against in the future, the voyage showed a very fair profit. They thought it would be better to keep the ship in the sugar trade, at least for the present. I turned over the page and read on. We have had a letter from our good friend, Mr. Jacobus. We are pleased to see how well you have hit it off with him. For not to speak of his assistance in the unfortunate matter of the bags, he writes us that should you, by using all possible dispatch, manage to bring the ship back early in the season, he would be able to give us a good rate of freight. We have no doubt that your best endeavors, etc., etc. I dropped the letter and sat motionless for a long time. Then I wrote my answer. It was a short one, and went ashore myself to post it. But I passed one letter box, then another, and in the end found myself going up Collins Street with the letter still in my pocket, against my heart. Collins Street at four o'clock in the afternoon is not exactly a desert solitude, but I had never felt more isolated from the rest of mankind as when I walked that day its crowded pavement, battling desperately with my thoughts and feelings already vanquished. There came a moment when the awful tenacity of Jacobus, the man of one passion and of one idea, appeared to me almost heroic. He had not given me up. He had gone again to his odious brother, and then he appeared to me odious himself. Was it for his own sake or for the sake of the poor girl? And on that last supposition, the memory of the kiss, which missed my lips, appalled me. 
for whatever he had seen or guessed at or risked he knew nothing of that unless the girl had told him how could i go back to fan that fatal spark with my cold breath no no that unexpected kiss had to be paid for at its full price at the first letter box i came to i stopped and reaching into my breast pocket i took out the letter it was as if I were plucking out my very heart and dropped it through the slit. Then I went straight on board. I wonder what dreams I would have that night. But as it turned out, I did not sleep at all. At breakfast, I informed Mr. Burns that I had resigned my command. He dropped his knife and fork and looked at me with indignation. You have, sir. I thought you loved the ship. So I do, Burns, I said, but the fact is that the Indian Ocean and everything that is in it has lost its charm for me. I am going home as passenger by the Suez Canal. Everything that is in it, he repeated angrily. I've never heard anybody talk like this. And to tell you the truth, sir, all the time we have been together, I've never quite made you out. What's one ocean more than another? Charm, indeed. He was really devoted to me, I believe, but he cheered up when I told him that I had recommended him for my successor. Anyhow, he remarked, let people say what they like. This Jacobus has served your turn. I must admit that this potato business has paid off extremely well. Of course, if only you had. Yes, Mr. Burns, I interrupted quite a f smile of fortune but i could not tell him that it was driving me out of the ship i had learned to love and as i sat heavy-hearted at that parting seeing all my plans destroyed my modest future endangered for this command was like a foot in the stirrup for a young man he gave up completely for the first time his critical attitude a wonderful piece of luck he said